Hi, everybody. Today, I'm going to talk about what I call extreme floating. What I'm doing is using a water repellent coating to make objects float that under normal circumstances would seem totally incapable of floating. You won't find any of this in a traditional fluid mechanics textbook, so I'm excited to show you this effect and give you a bit of an explanation. Let me start with a demonstration. This is an untreated steel ring. I'm going to try to get it to float by placing it on the water surface as gently as I can. This ring is not something you would expect to float. It's eight times uh, denser than water and just way too chunky. But here's the identical ring, but coated with a super hydrophobic coating. And you can see that the same ring floats easily. Oh, and by the way, I've set this up with a set of reflected straight lines so you can see the meniscus around the ring from the optical distortions of the straight lines. This photo shows it a bit better, I think. You can see from the shadow here just how far the ring sinks below the free surface. And here's a side view of the ring floating in a glass from which I was able to make an approximate measurement of the floating depth. The ring has a wire diameter of about one and a half millimeters and it sinks about four millimeters below the surface, which is really quite striking. That's more than two wire diameters below the surface. To illustrate just how unusual this is, I've created a sketch that is roughly to scale based on this measurement and some calculations. So you can see this is a pretty extreme case of floating. Now let me explain some of the interesting mechanics of this problem. When the ring is initially placed on the water surface, you have the surface tension forces on the inner and outer surfaces of the ring. But surface tension isn't sufficient to balance the ring's weight. So the ring continues to sink. As the ring continues to sink, the hydrostatic pressure on the lower surface of the ring increases. It increases linearly with depth. Eventually, the hydrostatic pressure on the bottom surface builds up to the point where you have a static equilibrium. The combination of the hydrostatic pressure on the bottom surface of the ring the vertical component of that hydrostatic pressure plus the vertical component of the surface tension on the inner and outer surface of the ring balances the weight of the steel. So you might wonder why this doesn't happen with an uncoated ring. The role of the super hydrophobic coating is that it prevents the water from flooding the region directly above the wire. If the region above the wire floods, then the ring will sink, but the coating prevents this. But here's an unusual technical point. You may be surprised to hear that Archimedes' principle still applies even in this case of extreme floating. According to Archimedes' principle, the total buoyancy force that the ring feels is equal to the weight of the displaced water. And that's still true here, provided we account for all of the displacement, including the water displaced by the meniscus. I'll get to how we know this is true in a moment. So what I'm telling you is that the buoyancy force that the ring feels is equal to the weight of this dark blue area, the total displacement. Now, the density of steel wire is about eight times greater than that of water. So for the weight of the displaced water to equal the weight of the wire, the volume of the displaced water has to be eight times that of the wire. And that is indeed the case here. So the total buoyancy force that the ring feels is not just due to the water that the wire itself displaces, but also the weight of the water displaced by the meniscus. This is an elegant result, which you won't find in any undergraduate fluids textbook, at least at the moment. But I hope that will change. A colleague and I have recently written a paper on this topic. Okay, I said I'd comment on how we know this is true that the total buoyancy force for a floating object is the weight of the liquid displaced by the object plus the meniscus. 
This amazing result was first proven for the most general case surprisingly recently in just 1998 by Stanford professor Joseph Keller. He used vector calculus and something called Gauss's divergence theorem. So I'll just give a non-mathematical explanation of the key result. Keller splits the displaced volume up into two parts shown here. The pink region is the water displaced by the wire and the water directly above the wire. The weight of this water is equal to the vertical pressure force on the wire. In fact, this is standard Archimedes principle. That's the source of buoyancy when we apply traditional Archimedes principle to large objects. The new result from Keller is that the vertical component of the surface tension force is exactly equal to the weight of the water displaced by the meniscus the two dark blue regions. And this is what I'm calling Keller's equivalency. This is an important effect for small floating objects where the volume of the meniscus is a significant portion of the total volume of displaced liquid. And I think it makes intuitive sense that the vertical surface tension force is equal to the weight of the water displaced by the meniscus because it's this force that pulls the water down, creating the meniscus. And now Keller has provided a formal mathematical proof. So now we have a unified version of Archimedes' principle, which gives rise to two equivalent physical interpretations of why uh, this superhydrophobic ring floats. You can either think of the ring as floating because the upward surface tension forces combined with the hydrostatic pressure balance its weight, or you can think of the ring as floating because the water repellent coating causes a large meniscus, which displaces more water. And more water displacement creates a greater buoyancy force on the ring. Keller has shown that these two explanations are mathematically equivalent. I'll put a link to his paper in the description. The second interpretation is helpful for understanding the limits on this type of floating. As you increase the weight of the ring, it can only sink so far into the water at some point, the meniscus will destabilize and water will flood the region above the ring, causing the ring to sink. To end, I thought I'd revisit these small wood disks, which I talked about in a separate video. I'll put a link to that video in the description. One of these disks has a hydrophobic coating and you can see that it floats much higher in the water than the identical uncoated disk. In the previous video, I explained this behavior in terms of the different surface tension forces on the two disks. But now we have an alternate and equivalent explanation using Archimedes' principle. You can see very clearly how the meniscus of the coated disk bends downward and displaces water. That produces a buoyancy force, which causes the disk to float higher in the water. But for the uncoated disk, the wood gets wetted and water is drawn upward into the meniscus. This is effectively a negative displacement of water. So this disc experiences a downward force due to the weight of water in the meniscus. So that's another completely equivalent way to explain the different floating behaviors of these two discs. And that completes this video. If you liked it, please hit subscribe.